I'm super excited about being here. This is my, um, I think my, my fifth, officially my fifth week on the job, and it's been an intense, intense journey. So I'm learning a lot uh, about um, what you folks do. Um, frankly, I believe as a CTO, uh, my answers actually aren't behind a desk. It's actually out talking to you folks. So while I'll do a lot of talking today, I, I'm just starting the conversation. Because uh, chances are, I'm going to be somewhere you know, in your neck of the woods having a, 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 a discussion with you about the challenges you face and, and some of the things that, uh, that pain you. Uh, and then we innovate around that. And so with that, um, I think I'm going to spend a little bit of time uh, talking about who I am and sort of how I make sense of the world and ultimately you know, what, what's in my tool bag to kind of drive forward uh, product strategy and innovation. Uh, a byproduct of that is um, these, are, these are things that are, are somewhat timeless. So you may be able to t take back these, these high level models and use them in, in your strategy. So um, let's see. All right. So this is what I call, this is a slide called the last 48 years in a nutshell. Uh, so the last name, the last name is, is Hawaiian. I'm from Hawaii. I grew up uh, on one of those dots. And, uh, and in, in, in all of the Hawaiian uh, language, this is a, a lesson in Hawaiian language, but you just pronounce all the vowels. So basically, my last name is Keanini. And so in case you folks were wondering that, you can just call me TK. That works. Makes for a shorter login. So uh, I actually was a musician first. That's, that's how I started out. And I, I do think music really changes the brain. I mean, I, I definitely think about things uh, in a different way, maybe in a musical way. And th there's terminology in music, actually, that, that we don't have in other languages. Like the, the term interval re refers to something that exists between two things. And, and chords are, are weird. They're very uh, system theory-ish. I think music does, does that for, for the human mind. Um, but guess what? Uh, I, I actually put down my bass and uh, picked up a computer because it paid better. Uh, and uh, not, not as many girls, the, but I, I, did have, I, did have fun. <laughs> I did have fun doing games. So I worked for a company called Broderbund Software for a long time. And, uh, and it was a very innovative time because I don't know if you remember, but there was a time where computers didn't have sound cards. They just kind of beeped. And you got really clever at making it beep. Uh, so so the, the idea was we were going after uh, a particular emerging market, innovating. And, and doing all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, I remember one day Sony came in. They flew out some executives from Japan uh, because they were in a panic. They, they figured out, they found out through uh, one of the distributors that we were going to start selling games on their archiving platform called CD-ROM. And they were going to talk us out of it because they, there's no way we could deal with the latency. We had done the double buffering. We, we're, we got this. I mean, I, we told them, we, we make software for the most impatient people in the world. These things, these things are this high. They click 80 times if you don't move something on screen. So I so had a lot of fun doing that. Frankly, I thought I was going to actually do that for the rest of my life. Uh, but things changed. And, uh, and I had done a lot of internet uh, engineering for uh, a lot of the ISPs. So my next gig was just to go drink from the fire hose um, at Cisco. I worked for Cisco for a little while, wore a cool blue badge. Uh, I took every course I possibly could, uh, just learned about the plumbing. And not just IP. You know, there's all, all kind of beautiful protocols back then that ran across the wire. Um, so I, I even uh, cut, you know, cut my teeth doing SNA stuff, uh, which, was, which was awesome. Um, but then that changed, and uh, I got recruited to go work for Morgan Stanley to do online trading. Uh, I told them I wasn't going to actually take the gig unless they gave me both security and data networking, because I, I knew those two camps, you know, they were, they were kind of mad at each other at the time. Uh, somebody invented this thing called a firewall that was guilty until proven uh, innocent. So, uh, so that, I, I just wanted to make sure it was socially stable. I got in there, again, super exciting time. If you can imagine, I mean, that was the first sort of at scale internet apps. Uh, Market Open was, we're talking about millions upon millions of flows, and then nothing, you know? And then Market Close, and all this capacity planning and what we had to do 
to make these systems work. You know, again, I learned something new. I throw it in my tool bag. I could use it somewhere else. And then uh, you know, online trading went poof. What happened? Where did all the people go? Uh, and uh, so when that, when that basically took a turn, uh, I, I was looking around the Bay Area uh, and started up a, a company called N-Circle. And we, we were under the belief that, you know, you just, just, you go, just fix all the vulnerabilities. Just do that, and you'll be safe. And there's just too many ways in. You know, bad guys only have to find one. You have to find them all. Uh, the, the strategy just isn't the, the dominant strategy uh, for defense. And a lot has changed. So, uh, so here I am at Lanco. And like I said, uh, I'm having a, a very good time. All right. So. Uh, a little bit of uh, retrospective before I, I get into uh, the meat of the talk. Um, how many of you folks have been doing this for over, let's, let's pick a number, uh, 15 years? All right, how about 20 years? All right, I mean, you know, the bad guys have been around, it's just a lot has changed. So if we go back 15 years um, and we look at, you know, what used to be, um, I remember a time when, when things were very fragmented, you know. The, the, the entire activity around capture the flag is f mimicking just getting in. And we know that that's only one stage now that we have to deal with. So this idea of, of, of attacks and vulnerabilities and things in isolation, uh, it just doesn't work anymore. Um, the threat back 15 years ago had a lot of deterministic characteristics. I mean, it, it actually was the majority of it was automated. There, there just was, there was a lot of machines attacking you. Um, and back then too, uh, exploits were pushed to you. Uh, the directionality of exploits, they, they, you know, discovery was about scanning. And when they found a weakness, it was pushed to the server. And that directionality has changed uh, a lot. And um, a lot of the exploits were single step kind of things. You know, one bullet, pop a server, you know, claim victory. Um, and um, a lot of the, the tactics were overt too. They, they, would, they would want bragging rights. I mean, in the early days, it almost seemed like a, you know, a ham radio club, you know. It was a bunch of enthusiasts that were sharing their craft with others. So when they popped the server, they would brag. I remember, remember the people working at Lawrence Berkeley Labs, just, you know, they were mad on their end because they had to go mop stuff up. But, you know, if you popped the server over there, you were like, woo, I'm a big dog, you know. And then on the bulletin boards, you were bragging about it. That doesn't go on these days. Uh, and then, uh, you know, threat intelligence was really optional. And um, I think that's, that's changed. So, you know, as opposed to today, where you really need something that is, uh, whether it's a scoring system, where it's a process, where, whatever it is, it's, it's cross-departmental. You know, it's, it's cross-multifunction servers. Things are very holistic. And in fact, the threat has crossed all those boundaries. So, it's, you know, it's time for us to kind of step our, our defenses up to be uh, more holistic. The, the threat's incredibly adaptive. Uh, sometimes, you know, shutting it off or removing it from the network might not be uh, what you want to do. You may, you may want to just slow it down to a crawl uh, because a lot of the automation has logic in it that essentially when detected, it'll go mutate. That, they have to start the discovery process all over again. But if you just contain it to be ineffective and you don't trigger that part of the code that says, to the adversary, you've been had, go mutate. Um, sometimes you can keep things more at bay. Um, the, the majority of, of uh, threat is now pushed to it. The victim is literally asking to be exploited. And, and that's the directionality uh, things have gone, which has pretty much rendered um, a lot of the diodes we, we look at uh, called firewalls uh, you know, just ineffective. Um, so it's, it's basically coming to them uh, as long as they have connectivity. And, you know, it's a multi-step process. Um, I worked um, a lot on the second version of CVSS, uh, the scoring system, uh, when I was at Circle. I, I did some contribution uh, that basically played down um, some of the, the factors in scoring, making it uh, a more faithful model. But it has one fatal flaw, which is, 
it deals with things in isolation. And, and frankly, while you may have a nice pretty score that you can rank and stack rank um, vulnerabilities, um, it's not the reality. I mean, there, there was an exploit for Chrome uh, a while back where the clever adversary you know, put together four very low scoring CVSS vulnerabilities all in a particular chain making what was a fantastic exploit. Um, and so this multi-step thing can't even be represented in scoring systems, and this is a problem. Um, covert tactics. So you know the cost to remain hidden is something very much in your adversary's mind. This, this, is, this is literally their economics. Because once you discover them, uh, they have to go back from automated to manual. Uh, they actually have to go and retool. Um, and once you guys start sharing with each other, it gets even more expensive to operate uh, on your systems. And then lastly, um, they're at the table. I mean, if, if, if your modeling or your strategy essentially doesn't have them in it, uh, it's probably deficient because a lot of what they're doing um, and their innovation and their life cycle even uh, drives um, what it is that your defenses, uh, how your defenses adapt. And that's, that's really the reality. You know, it used to be that exploiting a server was the, the, the end game. You, you, you know, had a party after that. Now it is just the beginning, right? So things have really changed in terms of, of that life cycle. So I'm, I'm a, just a big believer of, of feedback loops. I think a lot of complicated systems uh, can be managed well. Uh, through encapsulation and the right types of feedback loops. In fact, the term cyber literally comes from Norbert Weiner from MIT who described feedback loops. And you know, now I guess it just means the internet. Uh, but, but its origin actually does, does mean a process uh, that is cyclical. And you know, if, if your strategy doesn't look like a loop, then it, it probably needs some adjustment. Um, all right. so. Getting to, to what I'm going to talk about today, um, there really are two sort of buckets of, of what I'm talking about. They're related, but let me frame this up for you. Um, you know, the, what game theory does is, and, and this is what I'm really borrowing from, is it forces you to, to model conflict. And, uh, and it does it in a way that not only you can make sense of it, but you, you'll be able to explain it to the, the non-domain expert. And uh, so I'm going to borrow from uh, some, some game theory uh, uh, principles. And, uh, and then I'm also going to talk about um, the corpus of data that we call data information and knowledge. It's, it's sort of a pyramid. And I'm going to be very precise about how I talk about that. I, I think in, we are in an information space. So the more precise our language is about that space, frankly, the more we can get done, and, I, and the more we can socialize. So a lot of times, people talk about data when they mean information. People are talking about information when it's really just data. Uh, we got to get more precise about that. We, we will not go downfield if we can't get our language right, because what we do, frankly, is all about a social process that kind of moves us forward. So we'll go into that. And I just hope there's you know, some high level stuff you may be able to take back and use. And again, uh, I'm here, uh, you know, I, I'm here always because, you know, as you guys know, you, you'll know my Twitter handle, you have my mobile phone, and I just don't sleep. So, uh, okay. So holistic strategy. Let's start off with this. As I mentioned, I'm, I'm kind of a stickler about um, making sure um, that all the players are represented in in the scenario we're modeling, okay? And th this, I think, was some of the big mistakes people did with, with doing metrics, is they'd have great operational metrics. And this would, was measuring the performance of, of their security program. And they looked great, and they trended over time. The problem was, the bad guy wasn't in there. <laughs> and and that, they, that was really misrepresented, meaning it's kind of like, you know, the difference between you going to the gym and eating well and being fit and you winning the soccer game. You know, they're two different. You have to be fit maybe to even last 90 minutes, 
on the field, but it's still not the game scenario. And that game scenario, I think, is a very healthy way to, to represent conflict, because of course, we are, that's, that's what we do in our field. And, uh, and last thing, you know, if it doesn't look like a loop, it's probably wrong. And you, you have to pick you know, how many phases of the loop are, are faithfully modeling what, what you're doing. But, but you'll see, uh, I mean, even in Tom's talk, you know, there was an awesome loop that went like that. Um, you'll see a lot of uh, people talk about loops. And I, I'm going to talk about one in particular. So I read a lot on these guys. They're, they're kind of old and dusty guys. But they did a lot to write about strategies in conflict. Okay. So Sun Tzu did a lot of stuff. I'm a big fan of Musashi. How many of you folks have heard of the Five Rings? So it's, it's a very good read. Uh, again, if these things, these things really transcend domain, um, they've been used in the medical field. They've been used uh, in business. Um, so um, I'm going to talk about one in particular that I just always use. I mean, it's like my utility, utility knife. Um, anybody heard of John Boyd? OK. He's an interesting character, and, and, and it's a great read. There's a biography on him. Um, first and foremost, the dude was a fighter pilot. Okay? That, that was his love. And, uh, and he uh, basically was nicknamed 42nd Boyd because uh, as he was training fighter pilots, he would bet them that no matter what formation they were in, that within 40 seconds, he'd be in their six. And he had all these fancy maneuvers, and he never lost. And the, the bet was, if, uh, he, you, you'd owe him 40 bucks if, you know, if he won. So and he kept on winning, and, uh, and, and he was very good at that. So like all of these um, you know, like Michael Jordans of their domain, you know, they, at some point in time, they start to document what it is they do, you know, why they're so outstanding. And, um, and so as he started writing about this stuff, a lot of his uh, maneuverability theories went into building the F-16, which is a fantastic plane. Um, and these PDFs actually are on the internet for, for, for you to read. It's hilarious, because they're, they're basically scans of typewriter stuff, just to give you an idea of, of when they were written. But they are good reads. And as you can see, he talked a lot about you know, dominant strategies within conflict, which is why the game theory guys just love them. Um, but the thing I'm going to talk about actually the, here is he, he brought us what is called the OODA loop. And it's the, the, the beauty of it is it's so simple. Okay? So the concept that all combat, in do, indeed all human uh, competition, like in chess, soccer, business, involves a continuous cycle of observation, orientation, decision and action. Okay? It's really, really simple. And that, that's what, what the, the thing stands for. And, and when you really break it down, uh, what it comes down to is really kind of two phases. There's sort of an intelligence phase where your sensors and everything is, is delivering data, uh, your fingertips, you know, your ears, your eyes. But then there's the mental model, your sense-making activity that orients you in that. Um, all of which is sort of this intelligence phase of the OODA loop. Um, and, then, um, and then there's an execution phase, of course, when you actually make a decision, even if it's not to make a decision, uh, and, and then you take action, which then brings change to the world that feeds back into observation once again. Now, um, academically, you know, it's a bunch of feedback loops, and again, this PDF's on the, on the net, but I like it because it really helps frame, I think, what it is that we do. It helps us really evaluate whether uh, we're winning or losing or whether we have an effective strategy. So let's take this sort of red team versus blue team, uh, where the red is the adversary. Um, you know, their action, of course, is going to you know, move a piece on the game board. They're, they're going to exploit a server, do, do whatever they do. They're going to basically start moving down the, the kill chain. And then it's. Uh, it's, it feeds into the blue team's observation, right? And if that doesn't happen, you're, you're already pretty broken. Um, but, but a lot of times, you see a lot of observation. You, you folks have all the data. It's just orienting in that data 
such that you can make sense of it in the context of you know, where you are in the gameplay, that's what matters. And ultimately, you make a decision, an action, that changes the world. I don't know, you took the server offline, you did something uh, that gets observed by the uh, adversary, and round and round you go, all right? Now, if you, if you stayed lockstep with this, you'd have a game of equilibrium. You, you basically just be, you know, it's the, like a turn-based strategy game. And we all know that the adversary isn't going to wait their turn. <laughs> There's no rules. In fact, all they're trying to do is spin their loop faster than your loop. Okay, and that, that's the crux of the OODA loop, is the ability to spin your OODA loop faster, it'll leave the opponent disoriented. I, it doesn't matter how, how many numbers there are, it's the fact that you're at a sampling rate, you're bringing so much change to the environment, and your observations are so precise in your orientation that they just completely get disoriented in, in what they're doing, and it really raises their cost. So, if we look at this sort of in a summary, um, again, I, you know, I want to point out that the observation and orientation is really the, sort of this intelligence phase. And, um, and I, I like to use the word perceptive boundaries. I think we all, um, when we talk about sort of harmony in ecosystems, you know, each organism has a perceptive boundary. We do as humans, you know, dogs do, and this kind of defines really how, what, what we're limited to in our sense making and what decisions we can carry out and make change on the world. And so in the military, they call this the, you know, the situational awareness. And, uh, and that, uh, you know, having supremacy there is, uh, is job one. Uh, it, it usually involves some kind of instrumentation. Uh, you know, that's why we invent microscopes and telescopes. And, and frankly, I, I mean, when you look at Stealth Watch as a, as a tool, um, it is, in fact, bringing that data, the, the th things from your sense, uh, I don't want to say sense organs, but you know, your sensor grid, uh, and, and without it, you wouldn't be able to sort of sense make with it. You wouldn't be able to orient. So we definitely play on the, on the OO side of, of the OODA loop. Um, then there's, again, decisions and actions, which is going to change the game board and, um, and drive the cost up in your adversary's uh, observation and orientation. Again, you know, faster tempo, you win. Um, but ultimately, the, when you think about it from a cost perspective, um, you're, you're making it more expensive for them to hide. And this really actually matters. And you're doing it in the most cost-effective way. Okay? That, that's really what it comes down to, is you can spend, you can go broke uh, collecting all the data on your network. But what is the most cost-effective way to get a completeness, a holistic sensor grid, bring it in and make sense of it in such a way that you can drive decisions and actions? And that's, that's really kind of how the OODA loop plays into it. It is, it is the fundamental reason why I, I got on the phone and was excited uh, to take this position. Okay, so... Uh, again, super stickler about this whole data information knowledge pyramid. So I'm going to kind of walk us through that, and then I'll tie it together. Um, so telemetry, right? That's, that's kind of what we, we need. Um, it's, there's things going on on the network. There's change happening um, all over the network. The question is whether we can not only hear it, but whether we can make sense of it. Um, and so the multi, the sensor thing, uh, you know, again, when you look at NetFlow, the reason why it's so darn gorgeous is and when it's unsampled, it really is kind of the ledger of all the behavior that has happened in the plumbing. I mean, there, there is nothing, there is no place to hide, okay? It's, it's all there. Um, unsampled, I mean, the, the sampling actually messes things up, okay? So I'm sensitive to the fact that there, there is a temporal and a spatial aspect to this completeness, right? But again, unsampled NetFlow coming into StealthWatch, it's then StealthWatch and your job to get it into information and knowledge. Metadata is really the key to that transformation, right? That's all your context. And frankly, you know, the idea of, of not just thinking flow, 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 IP, 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 you know, to come at it from a different perspective to come at, you know, ask the question about the user. 
right? That's orienting to the metadata and looking at flows in that orientation. You know, the, the HR knows Alice, Bob, and Carol. They don't know 172.16.1.1. They just don't. Um, um, but it, in the corpus, all that has to be tied together. And, um, and it's, it's stitching that stuff together that really is transformational. And as we look forward, we hope to bring in more context so that you have more ways to derive information from the data. So again, observation of the data, completeness is very, very important. It just, it just is, because um, the more complete you are, the, basically the, the surer you are. The, the, when you make inferences from that data, you can be more correct. It, it's more useful. Um, and then lastly, orienting in the data is what creates information. So, you know, if, if you have a particular facet of the data and you want to start there and walk through the directed graph, you know, to make sense of the data, um, that, that's really how that transformation happens. And again, you know, when we look at data, information, and knowledge, data, like I said, man, it's just a bunch of signals and si symbols. I mean, as raw as form, that's what it is. It's because you have a craft, the knowledge of, of being a craftsperson in information security. Do you make sense of the data in a certain way? You create, actually, uh, information sets because of your knowledge, your know-how, right? So data is very atomic. You have to actually stitch it all together in a corpus to create what are called information sets. And I like to keep that nice and loose because, again, um, the beauty, um, anybody re read a book called The Wisdom of Crowds? It's a Sorokki book. Anyway, it, it basically speaks, uh, it goes into uh, what makes a, a smart crowd and a dumb crowd. Um, and and the, one of the things about a smart crowd is uh, that there are people at the table that are coming at it from a different perspective. The same thing, okay? And I'm thinking, this is exactly what bands do. I mean, you know, you don't, you don't, you go hire a bass player, a drummer, a guitar, you don't, you don't take the bass out of their hands, give them a guitar and say, you know, think like me, <laughs> let's make music. It just doesn't work that. But from a thought perspective, that's the wisdom of crowd is when you have somebody who is skilled in forensics, when you have somebody that's skilled in, you know, sort of the, the legal side, when you have somebody you know, skilled in the business, they come to the table and they're able to operate over the same corpus of information, that's really where the magic happens. Um, so that happens a lot when you basically have what are called synthesis and analytical forms. It, this is another thing I just go crazy about. But a, a lot of times people use the term analytics when they really mean synthesis. Okay, and vice versa. And these are two very different processes. One is an inductive process, the other is a deductive process. Okay? And they have different properties, meaning when you're synthesizing data, ambiguity is your buddy. Okay? It is your buddy. <laughs> because when you're ambiguous, you actually can synthesize the right corpus of the data to actually have a working set. Right? When you analyze, you're actually pivoting in that data or reducing in that data downwards, right? You're double clicking and getting more detail. You may be navigating, getting a different perspective. But again, this loop is very, very effective. And frankly, data is synthesized into information. And it's through synth you know, that, that loop between synthesis and analytics that you spin to get just absolute superior um, situational awareness. So that, that is, that's kind of my building blocks for this sort of holistic uh, strategy. It has to deal with the space we're operating in and the precision of that. It's an information space. And like I said, a lot of things break. Um, a lot of analogies break, mainly because um, we have models in economics and even just in, in other crafts that depend on a rival good. Uh, a rival good like a cheeseburger, right? If I make six cheeseburgers, sell you one, I have five, you have one cheeseburger. There's, there's a way to actually make, do that accounting and that observation by both parties, okay? 
in information space, when you steal my PDF file, I still have the PDF file. So it, it, it's a very different space when you act, that you have to model. In fact, D, you, could, you could make the case that DRM is trying to make a non-rival good into a rival good, such that you can glue on all this historical economics, right? But I, I say just you know, deal with it and, and get a model that represents what your craft is doing and, and, and continue on here. So again, that model of, of information uh, just has to be respected with the right amount of precision. So data information knowledge. And then you need a process. You need a process that represents a loop where you have an intelligence phase. That, you know, all the blue matches up, right? So in your observation and your orientation, you're doing it with at least the precision of that pyramid. And then this drives decisions and actions. Now, those decisions actually may be manual process. It might be you know, automated processes, semi-automated processes. But it's, it's very important for us to establish this because it'll drive how we sit in a larger ecosystem. It'll, it'll, it'll drive who we partner with. It even drives basically where the demarcation points should be for, for APIs and such. Um, and with things coming down the pipe, which we'll talk about tomorrow, like SDN, um, it is really important that we establish these boundaries. Uh, because that control plane of, uh, of SDN is a fabulous place to drive decision and action. But once that's done, I got to make sure I got observation coming back in so that I can reorient and back and round and round we go. This is absolutely going to make it really, really hard for the bad guys to basically take, take something in your network and persist on your network, right? I mean, you, you, can, you, you can imagine a network where you essentially like stainless steel furniture. You can hose the thing down and it, you know, it's basically back up. They just have no place to persist. Uh, and of course, they have no place to hide. So this is one of my, my favorite quotes from Sun Tzu. Um, the art of war teaches us to rely not on the likelihood of the enemy's not coming, but our own readiness to receive him, not on the chance of his not attacking, but rather on the fact that we have made our position unassailable. The time to do this kind of stuff is definitely, you know, as you're instantiating uh, information systems. So, there we go. Any questions? <laughs> Yes, sir? The one comment you made about making it more expensive. Um, and I agree, you talked about breaking the, the, the paradigm a little bit. Yeah. Um, I think you have a gap in that. In the APT world, uh, it's advanced persistent threat. So your bar for making it more expensive is, is probably exponentially higher. A pissed off employee or ex-employee hopefully. Yeah. Uh, Piss off employees is even harder. Um, but an ex-employee may not succumb to the expense paradigm, or a nation state yeah. may not, if they want what you got, yeah. Yeah. you can't make it too expensive. Yeah. You need to, so I'd, I think that the parameter there is expensive and or annoying. Yeah, so you're absolutely right. You know, the, there's a joke that basically goes, um, two guys in the forest, bear appears, one guy sits down, starts to put on his running shoes. The other guy's like, what are you doing, man? The bear's going to eat us. He says, look, I don't have to outrun the bear. I just need to outrun you. <laughs> okay? that, that scenario doesn't work when you're Google. right? There, there's some, they, they, that bear wants you. <laughs> and, and so there, there is that scenario. And it actually appears, you know, uh, it's a mistake in game theory, too, or I should say a gap. Um, because there are edge cases where you are dealing with irrational people. Okay. I shouldn't say irrational people. You have modeled them like yourself, okay? And, and frankly, their value system, their payoff, all of those aspects that motivate their behavior is you're thinking about yourself, not them, right? So it's really, really important when, you, when, when I say observe, orient, you know, decide, act. In that orientation phase, um, you have to take what is called, it's called an, in game theory, it's called an allocentric approach. So an egocentric approach is where I am basically observing and orienting around me. Okay, so the world around me is 
in, in perspective, my viewpoint. Um, in game theory, they talk about the, the more dominant strategy is an allocentric approach. And this happens in poker a lot, so it's a good analogy here. Um, in poker, my facial expressions and what I exhibit to the world is, is to drive change in your brain, not mine. So I'm actually not worried about my ob observations of myself. I'm modeling to your observations of my observations. And that, that second order thing is, is, is very important because we are dealing with, again, multiple profiles, as Tom um, said. So you almost have to run that scenario for each one of those profiles. And, um, and this sort of cost of doing business, you know, I, I, I put that more towards the organized crime side of things. And just because no matter what you do, if it's a profitable business for them, they're just going to keep on doing it. And in fact, they're, they're going to get, they're going to be hiring to do more, right? And uh, now there's even a more uh, complex supply chain um, that they're doing. I'm seeing all this innovation on their side, and I'm seeing very little or very slow uh, innovation happening on the defender side. And it, we really got to step that up. <laughs> Any more questions? All righty.